you'll join me in Acts the 10th chapter. Acts chapter 10, beginning at verse number 9. Amen. Acts the 10th chapter. Beginning at verse 9, we will read through verse number 16. The King James text today reads as follows. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending upon him as it had been a great sheep knit at the four corners and let down to the earth wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Amen. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment as we pray. Master, once again, God, we come before you. As the moment in this meeting has arrived when the Word of God must go forth, Lord, the messenger of God, that individual called by the Holy Ghost to this work to deliver the Word of God to the people of God. He humbles himself in your presence, Lord, recognizing that without the anointing of the Holy Ghost, there is nothing I can ever, ever say or do that would benefit or bless, help, encourage, inspire, or uplift the people of God. Lord, today I implore you, I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Oh God, do not ever let that great anointing pass from my life or from my ministry. It is the lifeblood of the preacher of the gospel. Master, in the name of Jesus, touch the ear of every hearer. Let us today, O oh God, have a heart and a mind to receive, not merely to hear, but to receive what the Spirit of the Lord would speak unto the church at this hour. For Lord, I believe you've given me a message at this moment in time that is imperative for the Pentecostal movement in particular. Oh God, help people of this way to listen and to hear what this preacher is about to say. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I understand when you hear this particular passage of scripture read our minds often go to a certain place it's as if we know automatically where the preacher is going and what it is that he is going to say because we think that we have the pulse of the spirit we think we have an understanding of all that this passage can communicate and all that it might speak to us. But I'm here to tell you today what you think I was going to preach on today is not what I'm going to preach on. How often do I do that to you? I want to talk to us today not on 
a message of inclusion, not on a message of God's acceptance of all people, regardless of race, color, creed, language, national origin, etc., etc. That is where most preachers will go when they read Acts 10, 9 through 16. But that's not where I'm trying to go today. The Holy Ghost has given me a word that goes off in a slightly different vein. I want to talk to us today on the topic, the joys of entering a new state. The joys of entering a new state. The Pentecostal movement today has regressed to the point that most believers do not even understand the language of the Holy Ghost filled church. What I mean by that is every church, every denomination, every cult, every a group of Christian people or every religious organization has its own vocabulary that they use. And there are certain words they'll use, and when they use that word, they mean a certain thing. Now, when a lot of Christians use certain words in that vocabulary, unbelievers, those who are outside of the church, they don't even know what we're talking about. When we talk about fellowship, for instance, when we talk about saints, you know, uh, they don't understand what those words even mean. When we use the word tithing, which of course I know 99.9% .9 of Christians avoid that word like the plague, but when we use certain terms and certain words uh, and phrases, they mean certain things within the context of the church. We call one another brother and sister. Well, of course, in the world, brother and sister implies a blood relationship, but in the church it implies a spiritual relationship that we enter into by reason of our having been born again, born of the water, born of the Spirit, born again the Bible way. But I'm here to tell you the Pentecostal church has as well its own lingo, its own language, its own vernacular. And today there are many in the church who don't even understand some of the most important terms that are found in the Pentecostal church. The term in the spirit has lost all meaning in so many churches today. Worship is now fully an act of the flesh. People still jiggle. They still wiggle. They still dance. But they do so of their own motivation and their own will. Folks still pray. But they no longer know what it is to pray until the power of the Lord comes down and the promises of God are seized upon and celebrated in the Spirit. Those who have traveled long distance by motor vehicle, as Tommy and I did just in the last month or so, as you travel across our great country, you know the joy that one feels as you read a sign that says you're now entering a new state. Amen. As Tommy and I were traveling from Florida back home, you know, I'd see the sign, you're now entering Alabama. Well, it wasn't that I was so excited to be in Alabama, but I was excited to be out of Florida. Amen. Seeing that sign then, we were making progress. Amen. And then we were closer home than we were just a mile back. And then as a little bit of time passed, we saw a sign that said, you're now entering Mississippi. Well, I got news for you. I was probably less excited to be in Mississippi than I was to be in Alabama. I was less excited to be in Alabama than I was in Florida. 
But each of these signs indicated that we were making progress. We were in a new place. We were further forward than we were a mile before. And there's great joy in seeing that sign that you're entering a new state. My goodness. This means you're making progress. Means you're closer to our goal than we were a mile back. But too many in the church today have never entered into a new state. A place different than they have been or a place different than they presently occupy. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? But the Lord has made provision through the power of the Holy Ghost for us to leave this world of sin, this world of struggle, this world of pain, oppression, and woe to enter into the new state of the Spirit wherein we are able to see things as God sees them. No things that and experience things which God has promised although they may not yet have been fully realized while many Pentecostals preach and rail against worldliness and assimilation to worldly views worldly mindsets worldly values they fail to encourage the saints of God to stay on spiritual terms where such vital practices are concerned as worship and prayer. Peter could never have come to the revelation and understanding of this most valuable and important truth as he did in our primary text today. God was able to show Peter something that Peter had never before understood. Peter would never have gone to the house of Cornelius and opened the door of the Christian faith, opened the door of the gospel to the Gentile world were it not for the vision and the revelation that he had on the rooftop this day. This was a powerful experience Peter had. And there's only one reason Peter was able to have this experience. Listen to me, children. Because Peter knew how to get into a new state. He knew how to, oh hallelujah, he knew how to get out of where he was and get into where God was. Amen. God is a spirit, honey. God don't occupy the realms of the flesh. If you think your old worldly, carnal worship is reaching the ear of God, I've got news for you today. You could not be more wrong. Pentecostal preacher who thinks that in order to grow your church, you've got to abandon the old I wouldn't give you a plug nickel for 98% of the United Pentecostal churches that I have visited in the last 25 years. I wouldn't give you a plug stick a nickel for one of them. They stink. There's no move of God. There's no power of the Holy Ghost. They forgot how to worship. They don't even know how to pray anymore. You talk about people getting in the spirit, they look at you like you're talking in tongues. They don't know what you're talking about. Most churches call themselves Pentecostal today. They wouldn't know somebody in the spirit. If God reached down from heaven, knocked them across the head and said, they're in the spirit.
I watch a lot of videos on YouTube. I watch a lot of stuff online sometimes. A lot of these big Jesus name churches. I love good preaching, folks. I love good worship. I love good singing. I like to be blessed. I like to be encouraged and lifted up and inspired in my faith like anybody else does. I go online and I look and I look and I look and I'm trying to find some inspiration. I'm trying to find something that will lift me up to a higher place in the Lord than I've ever before known. And what I keep finding are churches that have Pentecostal plastered over the top of their door, but they no longer know how to enter into the state of Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. They don't know how to get in the Spirit. Oh, I see people. I see men bouncing around. I see women bouncing around. I see people acting like they're worshiping God. But this isn't Pentecost. This is charismatic crap. I want to tell you something. You get somebody like this old preacher who knows what old time Holy Ghost religion is. You get a preacher like this old boy who knows what it is to get in the spirit. Who recognizes when somebody is in the spirit. I'm here to tell you, it doesn't take rocket science to know when somebody's worshiping in the flesh and somebody's worshiping in the spirit doesn't take a degree in theology even from a Pentecostal seminary or a Pentecostal Bible school to be able to discern the difference between someone who is worshiping in the spirit and someone who is worshiping in the flesh. And I promise you today the vast majority, the vast majority of what you see in Pentecostal churches, so-called, is fleshly worship. They have not entered into a new state. Everything they're doing, they're doing while they're yet in the flesh, while they're yet in themselves. They are fully aware and fully cognizant and fully in control of every move of every muscle. Tommy, when they get out there and do their little dance, they're out there doing their little dance. They're not in the spirit. I won't tell you when the power of the Holy Ghost comes down and touches your spirit and speaks something to your spirit and ministers something to your spirit and your spirit responds, not your flesh, your spirit responds. And because you're a child of God full of the Holy Ghost and you know how to yield to the Holy Ghost, you know how to let your spirit commune and fellowship one with another. You know how to step back and let your flesh step back and let your spirit have its way. All of a sudden you'll open your eyes and you don't even realize you've done danced all the way to the back of the church house. You done run around the sanctuary half a dozen times and you didn't even know you did it. Because you were in a new state. You weren't in the flesh. You weren't in control. Your spirit was. Hallelujah. Your spirit was responding to the touch of God. And as spirit-filled believers, you learn. You learn to step back. And to allow your spirit to freely interact with the Lord. You allow your spirit to communicate with the Father. You allow your spirit to celebrate the presence of the Holy Ghost. I've been in meetings growing up as a kid in the Pentecostal faith. 
Oh my goodness, have mercy. I can't even count them. Church started at 7 o'clock on Sunday night. The Holy Ghost got to moving in the church house. Oh my God, we got to pray in there. We got to worship it. We got to shout and we got to heaven church. And the Spirit of the Lord got to moving. And all of a sudden, by the time that service began to die down, by the time we even begin to think about getting in our cars to make the trek home, all of a sudden we look at our watch, Tommy, it was 1 o'clock in the a.m. Nobody in the church house was aware. Not a soul. Not a one of us was paying attention at the time. Not a one of us had any thought in the universe to look at our watch to see what time it was, see whether or not, well, time. Church should be over by now. No, when you're in the Spirit, time has no meaning. When you're in the Spirit, hunger has no meaning. Thirst has no meaning. Weariness has no meaning. You can be so tired, you can't see straight. But boy, when you get in the Spirit, all of a sudden, you'll turn around. You'll be so tired, you could have gone to sleep. And yet, you'll get in the prayer closet. You'll get in a place where you're able to allow that new state. You're allowed to, you allow yourself to enter into that new state in the Spirit. And all of a sudden, hours and hours and hours will pass. And all of a sudden, you'll finish your prayer meeting. You'll come out of that prayer meeting. And you'll be thinking, well, what time, what time is it, I wonder? And you look and you think that maybe an hour has passed. You look at the clock and realize it's been five hours. It's been six hours. Because when you're in the Spirit, things of this world, natural things, time, means nothing. Hunger means nothing. Thirst means nothing. Weariness means nothing. Exhaustion means nothing when you enter into the Spirit, when you get into that new state. Yet we've got churches full of people today. And boy, they're so proud of themselves. The UPC's got dozens of churches all over the country. So proud of themselves. They label themselves the Pentecostals of... Tommy and I were going through Mississippi, I think it was, and we passed by one enormous, gigantic, humongous church, and out front it said, the Pentecostals! Oh, they're so proud of the name! They're so proud of the label! Honey, they ain't nobody on this planet more proud to be identified as a Holy Ghost, fire baptized, tongue-talking, Pentecostal, one called Jesus name apostolic than this old boy in front of you right now. But I'm here to tell you, don't wear the name if you're not living the experience. I guarantee you, I'd be willing to guarantee you that if you went into that church, they're going to have the most spiritless, carnal, worldly, contemporary music that was ever invented. And that music does nothing, absolutely nothing, to encourage God's people to enter into the Spirit. It does absolutely nothing to inspire God's people to enter into the Spirit. It does nothing to bring God's people into a new state so that they leave their flesh behind and they enter into the Spirit. And I guarantee you somebody could walk into that church and they could feel the power of God. They could feel the touch of the Holy Ghost and their spirit could leap up within their body and shout and dance all over that church house and I guarantee you half the preachers in these churches that brag of their Pentecostal identity half of those preachers will be praying that God shut that person up sit them down Lord
because we have churches today that know nothing of entering into the state of the spiritual. Oh my God. I'm rebuking the Pentecostal movement today. Yes, I am. It's going to get better. Hang in there, folks. Hang in there with me. It's going to get better. Sometimes God's people need a good kick in the rear end. And those people today who brag about their Pentecostal heritage, who brag about their Pentecostal identity, they need a good swift kick up the backside today until their tailbone hurts. Peter received a vision from the Lord that allowed him to understand that while Cornelius, the man who was sending for him, a man who worked in the Roman armies, a man who, according to Jewish tradition and Jewish law, uh, Peter should not ever interact with and Peter should not ever have any uh, activity with, that this man was as deserving of the gospel and is welcome to the foot of the cross as any human being on the face of planet earth and God was able to bring this vision into clear focus before the eyes of Peter listen to me children because Peter knew how to enter into a new state Peter knew how to get in the spirit the word of God listen to me folks the word of God said Peter was hungry but, but, while the ladies were making dinner ready, or lunch, whatever meal it may have been, Peter went out on the rooftop to pray. Something had to change in Peter's situation while he was on the rooftop because all of a sudden, oh my God, his hunger didn't seem to register as loudly. Oh, time didn't seem to matter quite as much. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? All of a sudden, the Word of God says, Peter fell into a trance. Oh my God, don't ever say in a Pentecostal church today, that somebody went down to the altar and fell into a trance. That's just fancy lingo for saying that Peter fell into the Spirit. He got in the Spirit. And while he was in the Spirit, all of a sudden everything else doesn't matter anymore. All of a sudden you're in a whole new state of thinking and a whole new state of being. And time doesn't matter. Hunger doesn't matter. None of these things matter. But it was in that new state. It was while Peter was in a trance that God was able to give him a vision that allowed Peter to go into the home of a centurion and bring the gospel of Jesus Christ not only to that Roman but he opened the door to the entire Gentile world but that could only happen because Peter knew how to get in the spirit oh my God I remember many, many years ago, I was living in East Texas. My mother, her husband at the time, and my baby brother Dallas were living just a few miles away from me. I got down next to my bed to pray. And I was praying. And I got in the Spirit. And all of a sudden I saw what almost looked like a, a, a movie screen lower in front of me, literally. And on that screen I saw pictures of a boy laying on the side of the road with his little hand outstretched to the side of him. And there was a bike nearby and I saw a tractor trailer truck. 
I could not make out the boy's face, but I looked at his little hand, and his little hand looked just like my brother Dallas's hand, because Dallas used to have the same terrible habit I have to this day of, of biting on my nails all the time. And Dallas used to bite his nails and his little fingers. I could tell Dallas's hand, you know, a hundred miles away. And I looked at the little hand I saw on that boy laying on the side of the road. And I said, oh dear God, I believe the Lord's trying to show me something. I believe Dallas is in danger. I think something might going to happen to him. And literally, folks, it was around midnight, one o'clock in the morning. I'll never forget as long as I live, it was raining cats and dogs. I got up, I got in my car, I drove to my mother's house, I knocked on my brother Dallas's bedroom window. I didn't want to wake the whole house up. Dallas came to the window. He said, what are you doing? I'm standing out there in the rain. I said, Dallas, I need to pray with you for a minute. He said, what's wrong? I didn't want to scare him, so I said, nothing. I said, I just need to pray with you for a minute. So he opened the door to the house. I came in. We went to his bedroom. I sat down on the bed with him, and I began to pray over him. And as I began to pray over him, the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, it's not your brother. The boy you saw in the vision is not your brother. But listen to what God said to me. He said, but I want you to pray for him like he was your brother. So I began to pray like my little brother had been hit by a car while riding his bike. I began to pray as if it were my little brother who had experienced this. I didn't know who the boy was, but I began to pray. This happened on a Friday night, early Saturday morning. Sunday morning, I went into church, went to Sunday school, and in our Sunday school class, one of the other members of the church I was attending at the time said, we need to pray for the family of this little boy, and she named the boy. I'm not going to name him today. He's been gone a long time, and I don't want to... I don't want to bring up anything sad or negative in any way. But she said, we need to pray for the family of this little boy. She named him. She said, he was hit by a car while riding his bike yesterday. She said, a tractor trailer truck went by and he could not see to the other side the direction the tractor trailer truck was moving in. So he went to cross the street. He didn't see a car coming. It cleared the truck and hit him and he's lying in a hospital right now. They don't expect him to survive. Immediately a burden came over my spirit. I knew. I said, oh God, this is what you showed me just Friday night. Oh, I'm going to tell you there's a reason why, folks, we need to learn how to get in the Spirit. God can show you things in the Spirit. He can't show you in the flesh. I felt so heavy and so grieved I couldn't stand it. I'm trying to sit through Sunday school. I couldn't sit through Sunday school. So finally I get up and I went into the sanctuary. And I went down to the altar and I began to pray for this boy. I say, God, you don't show something like this unless you've got a miracle you're wanting to perform. Unless there's something wonderful you're wanting to do. Time for church came to start. So I got up and the pastor of the church I was in, he used to love for me to play my tambourine up on the platform with the other musicians. I used to beg him, please let me just sit in the congregation and play my timbrel. I'm not, I'm not trying to be up in front of everybody. I'm not interested. He said, no, brother, he said, the musicians love it when you play because you help them keep tempo and everything. They want you up there with them. I said, okay. So I'm up on the platform and we're trying to have the song service and I'm trying to play my tambourine but I got such a burden for this boy I can't stand it finally I put my tambourine down and I knelt down at one of the chairs in the choir loft and I began to pray the church sang another song or two then all of a sudden brother Alan stopped the pastor he stopped 
the service dead. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, folks, he said, oh my God, I feel such a spirit of intercession. He said, Brother Chuck, stop playing this timbrel a little while ago. And he knelt down and he began to pray. He said, I just feel the Holy Ghost coming down in a powerful way like the church needs to pray. He said, I don't know what Brother Chuck's troubled by, but I know that the church needs to pray. Oh, thank God for pastors who know how to get in the Spirit. All of a sudden, the whole service come to a halt. People begin to flood the altars. All the saints begin to come down to the front of the sanctuary. There was no preaching this whole service. They didn't even finish the song service. But the people begin to pray and they begin to intercede. And people begin to cry out to God. And oh my God, have mercy. We had a mighty move of the Holy Ghost that day. After service, I went by Sister Chambers' house. She was a little 80-something-year-old Holy Ghost-filled lady that would blow your socks off. You talk about somebody who knew how to get in the Spirit. See, I'm going to tell you, there's such a thing as living in the Spirit, too. That's where you're always on the cusp of being in the flesh and being in the spirit. You're always teeter-tottering on that line. It don't take the Holy Ghost but to go and blow you over and you're in the spirit. And that's where Sister Chambers lived. I went to her house after church. She said to me, she said, I want you to come over after church for lunch. She said, come to my house. So I went to her house. I felt led of the Holy Ghost to go see this boy in the hospital. He was at Methodist Hospital here in Dallas. We were living out in the Canton direction. I felt led to go see him at the hospital in Dallas, but I had no gas. And I had no money for gas. So I went to Sister Chambers' house for lunch. We're sitting there. And Sister Chambers said, <laughs> she says, God wants you to go see that boy in the hospital, don't he? I said, yep. She handed me $20. She said, here's the key. She said, here's the gas money you need. He also told me you needed the gas money. That's what a Holy Ghost filled church is supposed to look like. That's what Holy Ghost filled Christians are supposed to look like. That's how Holy Ghost filled people are supposed to walk and live and act. We ought to be able to hear from God without anybody having to say a word to us about nothing. Got up from her table, ran to the gas station, filled, put $20 in, but to which back then could practically fill your tank. Drove out to Methodist Hospital in, here in Dallas. Never been there before. I had to get directions and all. We didn't have all this fancy phone stuff back in the 80s. Went to see him. I walked in the hospital. I told the Nurses, I said, I'm a pastor from this boy's hometown, and they let me in. He was in intensive care. Nobody was in the room with him when I walked in. Nobody was there, just me and him. I picked up his little hand, and I held his hand in my hand. I looked down at it, and I thought, dear Jesus... If I didn't know for a fact that my brother was still at home... I would think this was my brother laying in his bed. I could not believe, Tommy, how that hand looked just like my baby brother's hand. Literally. Looked just like his hand. Shocked me. The only difference is my brother was a little bit older than this boy. But this boy was kind of big for his age, you know. But I couldn't believe his hand looked just like the hand that I had seen in my vision. I can't go into all the story. It's too much to tell. And I want to get on with this message. I want to make my point. I'm talking about 
what God can do when the people of God know how to get in the Spirit. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle John wrote the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. John began his writing of the book of Revelation by saying, I was in the Spirit <laughs> on the Lord's day. <laughs> he said, having been sent to the Isle of Patmos for the preaching of the gospel, having been exiled to the Isle of Patmos, he said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And then he went on to say, and I, John, saw. And he began to share everything he saw, listen to me, children, while he was in the Spirit. The entire book of Revelation would not exist today if it weren't for a man who knew how to get in the Spirit. Because it's only in the Spirit that God can show us things sometimes we need to see. It's only in the Spirit that God can help us to understand things that we need to understand. <sighs> Tell you, sometimes people got children who are drug addict, people got children who are addicted to alcohol, and children who are backslid and out of church. Then all of a sudden, some Sunday, they're in the house of God and they're praying for that lost loved one. And all of a sudden they find themselves slipping out of the flesh and sliding over into a new state. Hallelujah. And they slip over and they get in the Spirit. And while they're in the Spirit, you know what God shows them? God shows them their backslidden daughter, their backslidden son, back in the house of God, running the aisles, shouting, worshiping God. God is showing them, don't worry about your kid. Your kid's coming back. He may be backslid out there right now. He may be away from me right now. But he's coming back. Don't you worry about him. And all of a sudden you see old sister Johnson begin to leap and shout and dance and rejoice in the Holy Ghost. Not because her backslid son just prayed through in the altar. But because God has said it is. benefits of a new state the joys of entering a new state oh children I can't even tell you how wonderful it is I can't even tell you how wonderful it is to get in the spirit to leave the old flesh behind oh sister Johnson all of a sudden she's not living in the present She's not living in the what is. She's not living in the as things are. No, all of a sudden, she's in God's territory. She's in the Spirit. And it's while she's in the Spirit that God can show her something that hasn't yet happened. But boy, she can see it as though it's already transpired. And you wonder why we Pentecostal people, us true Pentecostal people, not Pentecostal in name only, but us true Pentecostal people, you wonder why we shout in church. You wonder why we dance in church. You wonder why we run the aisles in church. You wonder why we leap and we jump up and down and we roll on the ground. Honey, it's because what's going on in the spirit is so wonderful and so powerful that our body can't even find a way to respond. I 
I've been fighting the devil. I've been going through battles, going through trials sometimes that were just troubling my spirit so bad. My God, I thought I was going to lose my footing and backslide. I thought I was going to quit serving God. Going to quit living for what so discouraged and so depressed. All of a sudden, the Holy Ghost said, touch me. And the Spirit of the Lord would invite me. Come on now. Let's get into that new state. Come on now. Step out of the flesh. Don't worry about what's going on around you. Don't worry about those false brethren who are spreading lies about you. Don't worry about those people who are doing this. Don't worry about those who are saying that. Come over here. Get in the Spirit with me. And it's while I was in the Spirit that God showed me. I've given you victory. I'm here to tell you there ain't nothing the devil's against you that I'm not going to put under your feet and then all of a sudden without even knowing I was doing it in my body I was going <coughs> glory because in the spirit I was stomping on the head of the serpent hallelujah telling that old devil you're deceited you've lost the battle See, people get in the spirit. And you say, well, I don't understand why brother so-and-so doing that. I don't understand why sister so-and-so is acting that way. Why is she leaping around and dancing? I don't understand why brother so-and-so is shouting and screaming at the top of his lungs. Only place I believe people ought to shout and scream like that are in a football game. Only place I think people ought to, oh yeah, my Baptist friend, you don't have any problem with a man screaming at the top of his lungs, painting the half of his face one color, the other half of his face another color, pulling his shirt off, raising his hands up in the air, and screaming at the top of his lungs because some idiot hit a baseball over a fence. Oh, but we're not supposed to act like that in church. I'm here to tell you, honey, if you can't get in the spirit in church, where in the world can you get in the spirit? John had been exiled to the Isle of Patmos. This was punishment for crimes which he had committed according to the state. They had to do with his preaching Jesus of Nazareth. He'd been sent to this deserted island to die. And how did John respond to his circumstance? <laughs> he said, well, it's Sunday. <laughs> it's time for me to get in the Spirit. Hallelujah. I want to tell you, Paul and Silas are in prison. They got shackles on their hands. They got shackles on their feet. Oh, it's time to weep. Woe is me. It's time for me to cry. It's time for me to blame God for my present circumstance. It's time for me to lament over what's happening in my life. The Word of God said about midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises. And the prisoners heard them. Oh, I'm going to tell you something. There's value to getting in the Spirit. There's value to being able to get out of your present circumstance and your present situation, out of your negativity, out of your trial, out of your tribulation, out of your torment, out of your sickness, out of your disease, and enter into that sacred space with God that is in the Spirit. In spite of his dismal and depressing circumstances, John still was able to enter into that new state, leaving his horrific situation behind and finding his way into the presence of the Lord through and by the Holy Ghost. Many Pentecostal believers today don't even know what it is to step out of the flesh out of their troubles and trials and into the power and glory of Holy Ghost inspired change of state. In Ephesians chapter 2, 5 and 6, 
the Apostle Paul writes, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ, made us alive together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. Verse 6, and have raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't live in heavenly places. Since I came to the Lord, I don't have a heavenly address. But the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 2 that God has made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I will tell you, if you don't know what that means, you've never been in the Spirit. Because when you get in the Spirit, all of a sudden you find, as the old Church of God song said, we're made to sit in heavenly places with the Lord. When the Holy Ghost comes down, in 1 Peter 1, 7-9, the Apostle Peter writes that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Listen. Whom having not seen, ye love, in whom... Though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. <laughs> Ooh. If you ain't never been in a Holy Ghost service where the power of the Lord comes down and the glory of God is revealed in the sanctuary of the saints, then honey, you don't even know what Peter's writing about. He said, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I ain't never seen anybody rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory unless they were in the Spirit. I've never seen it. In Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27, the Apostle Paul writes, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for, as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. Listen. With groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I'm going to tell you, sometimes when you get in the Spirit and you're praying, you, you can't even put words to what you're trying to talk to God about. Your heart is so broken. Your spirit is so wounded. And you find yourself just groaning. You find yourself just uh, uttering uh, vocal expressions. Oh God, oh God. Oh Jesus, Lord, oh Lord. Oh, but we're not supposed to act like that in church. In Jude chapter 1 verse 20, Jude, the brother of Jesus writes, But ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. He's talking about praying in the Spirit, folks. He's not talking about sitting there being in control of every word you speak. He's not talking about you being mentally and uh, cognitively engaged in everything that you're saying and everything you're talking to God about. No, 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 no. He's talking about entering into that new state, hallelujah, where your spirit begins to pray and your spirit begins to cry out to God. That's what we call talking in tongues. That's what we call praying in the spirit. 
And the, and the apostle Jude said that as we pray in the spirit, we are building up ourselves in our most holy faith. I'm trying to be quick today, but I know I'm taking a lot of time. All the early reports of Pentecostal revivals back at the early part of the 20th century, the Azusa Street revivals, listen to what was written about the Azusa Street revivals. Worship at 312 Azusa Street. For those of you that don't know, Azusa Street is a place in California where a mighty outpouring of the Holy Ghost was experienced at the beginning of the 20th century. There was a black preacher there who headed up these meetings and it was attended by white folks and black folks. It was attended by Hispanic folks and Asian folks and the power of God used to come down in such a marvelous, powerful way. It was a brand new Pentecost. Listen, worship at 312 Azusa Street was frequent and spontaneous with services going almost around the clock. Among those attracted to the revival were not only members of the holiness movement but also Baptists, Mennonites, Quakers and Presbyterians. An observer at one of the services wrote the words no music excuse me no instruments of music were used none are needed no choir the angels have been heard by some in the spirit no collections are taken no bills have been posted to advertise the meetings no church organization is back of it who are in touch with God realize as soon as they enter the meetings that the Holy Ghost is the leader. Hallelujah. The Los Angeles Times wasn't quite as kind in their description of it. The Los Angeles Times wrote meetings are held in a humble, excuse me, in a tumble down shack on Azusa Street and the devotees of the weird doctrine practice the most fanatical rites, preach the wildest theories and work themselves into a state of mad excitement in their peculiar zeal. Colored people and a sprinkling of whites compose the congregation and night is made hideous in the neighborhood by the howlings of the worshipers who spend hours swaying forth and back in a nerve-wracking attitude of prayer and supplication. They claim to have the gift of tongues and be able to understand the babble. Mind you, that is a secular newspaper. That's how they reported what was going on at Azusa Street. Charles Parham. This man was a sharp critic of what was happening, because there were critics, of course. He wrote, men and women, white and blacks, knit together or fell across one another. A white woman, perhaps, of wealth and culture could be seen thrown back in the arms of a big, I'm reading, buck nigger and held tightly thus as she shivered and shook in freak imitation of Pentecost. Horrible, awful shame. <laughs> the first edition of the Apostolic Faith publication claimed a common reaction to the revival from visitors. They write, proud, well-dressed preachers came to investigate. Soon their high looks were replaced with wonder. Then conviction comes. And very often you will find them in a short time wallowing on the dirty floor, asking God to forgive them and make them as little children. Oh, I'm going to tell you, when people know how to get in the Spirit, God knows how to get things done. 
We got churches call themselves Pentecostal. They they think the more in the flesh they get, the more they're going to accomplish for God. You're an idiot, preacher. You're an idiot, overseer. You're an idiot, superintendent. You're an idiot, general overseer. If that is the mindset that you hold today, you are an idiot. The Holy Ghost revivals of the early 20th century brought blacks and whites into unity. It moved millions of believers into a new understanding of the importance and value of prayer. It led believers into a new form of worship as they laid aside their fleshly concerns and allowed their spirits to become engaged in sincere passionate and expressive acts of worship and prayer. When one understands the nature of the state of being in the spirit, they understand that while in this state time has no meaning and your heart is free to express itself without constraints. Issues of the flesh no longer seem to affect one who is indeed in the spirit. Hunger, thirst, weariness, fear, worry, anxiety, depression are all set aside as we enter into that new state. While so many in the church today are perfectly satisfied with churches full of people who know nothing of that new state known as being in the spirit. I'm here to tell you today, folks, this preacher is not. God's church is incapable of being all that it can be, doing all that it can do, and living all that it can live without its people understanding the value and importance of entering into that new state. We must learn to enter into the Spirit, and we ought to long for and crave such a state. For it is in that state that we grab hold of the altars, the horns of the altar, and we seize upon the promises of God. It is in that state that we worship the Father in a manner which He desires as He desires we worship Him in both spirit and in truth. According to John 4, 23 and 24, Jesus said, But the hour cometh and now is, listen, when the true worshipers, well, what does that tell you? That tells you there are some people who are false worshipers, huh? He said, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Now listen to the next sentence. God is a spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Children, God is a spirit. It therefore follows according to the words of the Lord that the most effective worship, the most effective prayer, the most effective communication we might have with Him is achieved when we enter into the Spirit. Am I telling the truth? Lord, help our church to once again yearn for the move of God that ushers us out of the flesh and into the Spirit. We need to once again know the joys of entering into that new state. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. I realize today's message for many of you is probably something you've never heard. If you're not, you've never been in the Pentecostal movement. <laughs> you, many of you have probably been in the Pentecostal movement for decades and have never heard a message like this. 
But I'm here to tell you, there's a reason God fills with the Holy Ghost. There's a reason God baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And the reason is not so you can talk in another language when you pray. That is not the reason. That is the initial physical evidence that you've received the Holy Ghost. It's not the reason you receive the Holy Ghost. The reason you receive the Holy Ghost is so that God can quicken or make alive your spirit. And so that your spirit, married to His, can enter into a unity, can enter into a fellowship, a oneness. So that now you're able to slip out of the flesh, as it were, and slip into the spirit. And you're able to communicate with the Father in the Spirit. You're able to worship the Father in the Spirit. You're able to grab hold of the promises of God in the Spirit in ways that you cannot possibly accomplish in the flesh. Oh, children, I'm here to tell you today, the joys of entering a new state. Hallelujah. Will you stand with me this afternoon? Praise the name of the Lord.